Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for <coughs> attending to this seminar. Uh, before everything, I should apologize for any inconvenience because I have caught, uh, caught cold, and I apologize for that. Today, I'm going to present some highlights uh, about application of the finite element analysis, or FEA, in biomechanics, and also we, I used computed tomography imaging data in this order. Now let's see, <clears throat> first see what is finite element analysis. Based on Wikipedia, the finite element analysis, or FEA, is a numerical method for solving problems of engineering and mathematical physics. Uh, one of the most important things engineers and scientists uh, to do is modeling natural phenomena. For example, consider here, we have hips, sacrum, and femur here, and we want to see the uh, effect of applying load on the head of the femur. So in this reason, we should develop conceptual and mathematical models, and we should separate this part of the body and uh, study the boundary conditions, and then we should uh, follow up <clears throat> and find the mathematical models to predict and simulate this physical phenomena. In this order, we need to extract some uh, formula, could be in algebraic, differential, or integral equation. And for example, we could have some elasticity equation. And as you can see, most of them are in the differential equation. <clears throat> and sometimes finding the exact solution for this equation is a difficult task. So in such cases, finite element analysis help us, and this is one of the most commonly numerical methods uh, to provide alternative means to find a solution for the uh, following complex uh, equation. And in this order, we have some steps. First, we should discretize the domain with these simple primitive shapes depending on what type of the analysis we want to follow up, we can select some type of these elements or combination of them. Here, we discretize the domain, the femur domain, with these simple elements. Then we should derive an assemble element equation. <clears throat> After that, we should apply material property, each element should have its material property, which come from the model. And then apply the load and boundary condition. Here, boundary condition on the, at the bottom of the femur is the fixed constraint. And, <clears throat> excuse me, then solving the equations, and at the final step, we can show the distribution of the result. Here shows the result of the finite element analysis, and it shows the distribution of the stress all around the body from the head of the femur to the bottom of that. And as you can see, each color represents its own uh, result or stress in megapascal. For example, red color indicates the higher amount of the stress, while the blue one shows the uh, minimum amount of stress. And this analysis shows we have the maximum amount of stress in the neck of the femur. Now let's have a quick see at the, what is the computed tomography, or CT. This is a non-invasive medical examination that <coughs> excuse me, uses a specialized X-ray equipment to produce cross-sectional image of the body based on the FDA definition. You can see we have here an uh, uncovered CT device, and here you can see the X-ray tube. On the opposite of that, you can see the row of detectors, and this is called the gantry. <coughs> Excuse me. By simultaneously rotation of the gantry and movement of the patient table, we can have the slice by slice X-ray images of the uh, body organ. 
Here it shows an example, an animation of the CT images, a slice by slice. You here you can see the vertebra, and then you can see the hips, sacrum, and femur, from the top to the bottom of the body. Now, <clears throat> here's a few application of FEA in biomechanics. Uh, it showed the <clears throat> femur meddling after using the CT techniques, CT imaging techniques. We have the slice by slice X-ray images of the head of the femur. And then we applied discretization steps in the finite element method. And after that, here shows the discretized model. And after that, we can apply and enter the material property from the model to the <coughs> uh, finite element. And we can uh, use this type of application to see the effect of the loads, which applied at the head of the femur and see the distribution on the neck of the femur and see where is the critical position uh, in applying uh, the load. Here shows an example of finite element art, uh, analysis in orthodontics. <clears throat> you can see this is the maxillary central incisor and the red portion shows the pulp of the teeth, tooth, excuse me, and the blue color around the root shows a um, periodontal ligament, ligament, which is a <coughs> impact observer, impact damper around the root. This shows the molar with three roots and pulp and pedial around the root. And this shows all of the teeth in maxilla. And <clears throat> actually we did that to uh, design some parathes for a veteran which uh, lost the right part of the, his maxillary teeth. And we used this model to design some parathes. And uh, we used the left side to uh, give good support for that parathes and analyze that and selected the best position to put the parathes around the teeth. Now, some of my previous works actually been finite element modeling in vertebra using techniques from medical image processing and finite element analysis. Uh, in this order, to predict the failure initiation or to evaluate treatment in human vertebra, samples extracted from the cadavers, and then they were CT scanned. This is type of the CT sliced images. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the CT scanned process to convert into the finite element model. First, uh, cre we created the 3D model and then we discretized that and applied material property. And after applying the force and boundary condition, we can see the result of the stress distribution of the stress all around the body of the vertebra. We use that, <coughs> excuse me, we use this method to predict any failure, failure initiation or, and, or to follow up the treatment method which performed on the vertebra. In order to compare the effect of the treatment on the vertebra, we <coughs> created three types of the samples. First, this is the intact sample, which extracted from the cadavers. This is the defective sample, which as you can see here, we created an artificial defect inside that by using CNC machine. And here is the augmented sample, or after treatment, where uh, the sample filled up with uh, some special bone cement. <coughs> Excuse me. The process or flow chart that we followed is, as you can see, is following. First, the sample or patient goes to the CT imaging, and the CT device or CT imaging gives us the raw images. 
And as you can see, we have the gray color around the body. We should uh, remove and get rid of this part. For this reason, we process the images and remove the unnecessary surrounding. And then we assembled the slices and then made the 3D model, finite element model, applying boundary condition, material property, loads, and extract the load displacement diagram. Here you can see the animation of the <coughs> excuse me, raw images. You can see here we have gray color around the bone, around the vertebra. This could be the shadow or uh, images of another organ which is near or next to the vertebra. We should get rid of them. So by applying image processing techniques, we removed all unnecessary surrounding around the bone. Then we assembled the slices to check the shape and continuity of the model. You can see this shows the slices from the uh, superior end plate of the vertebra to the inferior end plate. This shows the wireframe model of the vertebra. The application of this type of model is uh, we can quickly or at a glance can take a look at the detail of uh, vertebra is inside that. This shows the three-dimensional model of the vertebra, and by using this type of model, surgeon can 3D print that to make their plan before the surgery and make more familiar with the body before uh, any operation. This shows the voxel-based finite elements. <clears throat> the name is voxel-based because each element comes from the voxel or uh, pixel images of the CT uh, slices. As you can see, this shows one slice of the CT image, and uh, <clears throat> we discretized that exactly uh, equivalent to the pixels from the CT image, and we put the element on each pixel, exactly the same size of the pixel, in, uh, in this analysis, the pixel size was 0.25 by 0.25 millimeter, so the size of the element is the same, but the slice thickness was one millimeter, so in this reason we swept the element one millimeter and make a cube element equivalent to voxel of the CT images. Then, <coughs> excuse me, we repeated this procedure for all the sections, and you can see the creation of the elements from the inferior end plate to the superior end plate of the vertebra. After that, next step is applying the material property, and in this order, we calculated material for each element and applied that in the model from the bottom to the top, you can see each color represents its own property, its own material property, including modulus of elasticity, Poisson ratio, density, and etc. Uh, as bone material property comes from the density of the bone, uh, we first we should create the uh, distribution of the bone mineral density uh, for the bone or for the vertebra. And then, and you can see this shows the distribution of BMD. And then each, each amount of the density uh, by applying the uh, related formula can convert to modulus of elasticity, Poisson ratio, and uh, mechanical properties. <coughs> And as you can see, this has another, can we have another application? We can cross it, remove some uh, outer part of, the, of that, and uh, take a look at inside the body and see the distribution of the density, and we can see if there is any osteoporotic defect inside that. So, Depending on the CT slice thickness and resolution of the CT imaging, <clears throat> because our elements 
exactly are corresponding from the corresponding uh, or equivalent to the voxel size. It dictates the number of elements. So for this reason, we have a lot of elements and it caused, uh, uh, it caused computational cost, it increased the time of the computation, it needs uh, a special hardware. To overcome that, we applied mesh coarsening, <coughs> excuse me, and as you can see, we increased the size of the elements. Instead of 0.25, we increased that to one by one and it incre significantly incre decreased the number of elements and increased the speed of analysis. If you take a look at this part, and I zoom it in, you can see we have different color. And as I told you, as I said, each color represents its own material property. And if you look at this one, it means that it has different material property with its neighbor. So it calls heterogeneity, and uh, we actually applied heterogeneous material property in our model. The next step is, <coughs> excuse me, applying boundary conditions. Here we wanted to simulate the lifting situation on the vertebra. For this reason, we fixed the um, inferior end plate in the axial direction while we applied displacement in axial direction on the superior end plate. And after performing the finite element analysis, we have the distribution of the stress all around the body. And as I mentioned before, each color represents its own um, magnitude of the stress, and the red color shows the maximum amount, while the blue one shows the minimum amount of the stress. <coughs> Excuse me. As uh, each finite element analysis should be validated, the result should be validated because we don't know if, uh, whether the uh, result is correct or not. So we validated the finite element result with experimental, with experimental, uh, experimental test. We took the sample to the lab and put uh, similar compression on the vertebra and extract the load displacement diagram. As you can see, the black color shows the uh, load displacement diagram for the uh, experimental, and the red one shows the finite element uh, curves. And here you can see the slope of all curves are the same, so this shows that the stiffness of the both analysis are the same and it validated the results. After that, we go further a step, <coughs> excuse me, and we perform failure analysis on the vertebra. As you can see here, and take a look at the amount of the load. It's around 500 Newton. By applying this, this load, we can see some micro failed, micro failure elements on the body. And by increasing the amount of the load, for example here to 2000 Newton, number of the failed region increased. Again, by applying, by increasing the amount of load, the number of the failed region increase, they grow, they join together, and make a weak area uh, around the vertebra. And it caused the final fracture, and after that, it shows that we have the final fracture and analysis is stopped. Here shows animation of the <clears throat> progression of the failure pattern, failed region, all around the body, you can see first we have uh, a small number of failed region, and then they increase, they join together and make the weak area. And it shows the um, prediction of the collapse region from the finite element analysis by applying the compression load on the top of the vertebra and fixing the bottom of that. You can see the collapse region, which it predicts. And also this prediction 
validated by the experimental result. You can see we have here, we have collapse region, which is exactly the same that finite element predicts. This shows the progression of the failed region. Here, blue color indicates the failed region. And from the posterior lateral view, you can see the creation and growing the failed region. Here it shows the anterior lateral view of the failure pattern. Again, the blue color indicates the failed region. Here, again, we validate the <coughs> predicted result by, uh, here by plane radiography. As you can see here, it predicted failure in the lateral view, lateral view of the vertebra. So plane radiograph of lateral view of the experimental result, experimental sample shows the same behavior of the fracture. And also here, it shows the anterior posterior view and the X-ray from the anterior posterior direction shows the same behavior of the fracture. To, uh, to study the effect of the, <coughs> excuse me, defects inside the sample, as I told you before, we separate some intact samples and then we create the artificial defect inside that by using the CNC machine. This shows the X-ray of the defective sample and you can see the size and location of the defect inside the vertebra. And by following the same procedure, we establish the finite element model and then analyze that. And also this shows the bone mineral density distribution layer by layer from the bottom to the top of the sample. And you, you, here you can see the cross section of the defect in each layer, each section. After that, we applied the load, the boundary condition on that and analyzed that <coughs> and saved the data to compare, for, to compare with the intact and treatment sample. The model has the ability to predict the osteolytic effect and also osteoporotic defect in the model. To a study the effect of the treatment. We follow up the augment, augment, augmentation procedure or vertebroplasty. In this procedure, we uh, injected some special bone cement inside the vertebra. And you can see this is the augmented sample. And then we applied the same procedure to model the finite element. This shows the CT images. This shows the finite element. And here you can see the tip of the, the place that we injected the cement inside the vertebra. Result of augmentation model shows that although it increased the height and strength of the vertebra, but here you can see some end plate fracture on the augmented samples, which this fracture pattern validated by the experimental test. And in, in this sample, in this sample, it predicts the fracture on the end plate in this direction, which is validated by plain X-ray radiograph. You can see here the fracture pattern and it shows the bone cement or PMMA inside the sample. To uh, study the effect of the position of the bone mineral, uh, of the special bone cement inside the vertebra, we simulated the vertebroplasty with a special shape. Here we uh, got the uh, a spherical shape of the PMMA or bone cement and put it in different position inside the vertebra. 
For example, here we placed, it shows a section of the vertebra, which you can see the bone cement inside that. We placed the PMMA or bone cement closer to the superior end plate here. And here we place that closer to the inferior end plate. Here it placed closer to the lateral wall. And here it placed closer to the anterior wall. And here it's closer to the posterior wall. After analyzing all of these finite element models and putting the related uh, force and boundary conditions. <coughs> we extracted the results to compare. This shows the uh, strength distribution of the vertebra and the horizontal axis shows the different position for each vertebra. Here is the position for L1 positions of the bone cement for the L2, position of bone cement for T12, or thoracic vertebra. And as you can see, the red color shows the intact model. Before uh, analyzing, we performed finite element analysis, and we find the strengths of the intact samples. Then we created the defect, artificial defect inside the vertebra and uh, performed analysis. And you can see the distribution of the uh, strengths. It shows that the defect, existence of the defect inside the vertebra decreased significantly the amount of the uh, strengths comparing to the intact uh, strengths for all of the samples. Then we analyze the effect of the augmentation, and the blue one show the strengths of the augmented model. And as you can see here, in posterior location, we have the we have much increase, more increase in the strengths for the lumbar one. And here also, it shows that if we put the Bone cement, place it in the pos pos posterior position, it has more increase in the uh, strength for the lumbar two. And the, actually for the thoracic, it predicts the same behavior. To simulate the, <coughs> excuse me, distribution of the uh, bone cement inside the vertebra. We simulated the PMMA with uh, elliptical shape and by positioning the major axis of the ellipse in different direction, we simulated the position of the, uh, the distribution of the PMMA. For example, here, the major axis, it shows a cross section of the model, which bone cement is injected inside that. You can see the major axis of uh, ellipse is located in the superior inferior direction. And here, the major axis of ellipse located in anterior posterior direction. And here, it's placed in mediolateral direction. And after analyzing all of these models, <coughs> You can see the comparison between the intact, defective, and augmented models. Again, this vertical axis shows the strengths in kilonewton, and the horizontal shows the distribution of the bone cement for each type of the vertebra. The red color indicates intact, the green shows the defective, and blue shows the augmented model. You can see by comparing these results, the normal is here for all of the vertebra. Defects reduce significantly the strengths of the vertebra comparing to the intact for all of the samples. And augmentation here, 
in different direction or different distribution. For example, here in anterior, posterior. And, but here in superior, inferior, we have more increase in the amount of the strings. Here for lumbar two, superior, inferior is higher. And here, again, it's higher, but it's closer to the another amount. So it showed that by choosing different position and different distribution or direction, we can gain uh, different uh, amount of the strengths in the vertebra. So we should consider that during the vertebroplasty procedure. As a summary, through this presentation, you saw there are many applications for the finite element analysis in biomechanics, and also saw the ability of finite element to predict failure creation and follow up the effect of the treatment on the defective vertebra. We got intact sample, created defect inside them, followed the augmentation procedure, and created the finite element analysis and sh it showed that uh, the side effect of the augmentation and the amount of the increase which uh, when we placed the different location and distribution of the bone cement inside the body. Um, that's it, thank you and let me know if you have any question. What is bone cement? What is it made of? Uh, it's made of the polymetal uh, methyl acrylic. PMMA is a special uh, composition which is compatible to the uh, body. And we, uh, when we uh, injected that inside the bone, uh, the bone can tolerate that and uh, uh, won't reject that. And it's used just for experimental stuff? No, it's used for medical procedure. Uh, when somebody had a fracture in, in his or her vertebra, they can inject this type of cement inside the vertebra and it recovers the height of the vertebra and uh, can go to uh, regular or normal activity. What's your criteria for failure? For failure, each type of the, each Mm, actually position or each material uh, inside the vertebra has its own ultimate strength. And we define this criteria in analysis. If the amount of the stress reach to that level, it fracture and uh, goes out of the analysis. Yes? Um, so you were showing the finite element model for that segment of the spine and then the build in bone um, augmented model. Have you guys done any simulation along the entire spine to show how that segment acts with the full load on it, or do you simulate mm. the additional load from any point above? Yes, yes. It, the full analysis of the spine showed that uh, it, uh, the rigidity of the spine increased and the load tolerance <coughs> changed, and it's uh, uh, some and uh, we have another fracture on the vicinity or neighbor, neighbor uh, vertebra inside the uh, spinal column. And, and um, then, uh, when they do the bone marrow cement, or they do the cementing, is there, when, it, when that cures and whatnot, is there any sort of, do they ever see any sort of separation between the actual bone itself and the cement? And yes. Do you yes. simulate that in any sort of No, I, I didn't do that, but yes, there is a, a special area or zone around the bone cement and the bone which uh, actually has nothing inside that. Yes. How do you extract uh, the box, each voxel's material property from a given CT oh, scan? Let me show you.
we extracted the material property based on the bone mineral density. Each bone mineral density has its, actually we have some equation which converts the bone mineral density to mechanical property. We use this distribution for that reason. For the material properties per uh, system, <coughs> uh, what's, have you checked the sensitivity, for example, if you use a, a, a homogeneous uh, material property throughout versus uh, different material properties for each element? Mm -hmm. See, it seems to me when, when we did this work, it was not that sensitive uh, to the variation of defining each material with different material properties. Only it becomes uh, important when we talk about the cortical bone versus the spongy bone because mm -hmm. the material properties between the two is significant. Okay. Let me show you this. Actually, this, an this analysis shows the sensitivity uh, of the material property, of, of the model to the material property, because you know the ultimate strength of, the, of this type of bone here should be more than 5,000 Newton. But uh, as you can see, depending on the heterogeneity of the material, here with the lower amount of the force, we have some failed region, which it showed that it depends on the heterogeneous of the material property. Now this graph, the difference between this graph and the P graph, there is a, uh, basically a shift of uh, close to two millimeter. And I think that's just basically uh, an experiment really noise because when you apply the, exactly. the, the load it takes a while for the, the specimen to capture that load mm -hmm. yes. but you capture it right away so when I look at the two graphs that shift that, I like that shift I mean, that two millimeters mm, yes you noise. are right yes you show that you are absolutely right here <coughs> it shows that we have more displacement, and it's because of this rubber which put on the top and bottom of the vertebra to simulate the intervertebral disc. And so when, when we start applying the compression load, it takes a lot to reach the bone structure to sense the load. So this, is, this shift the load displacement to this position. All right. If there's no more questions, let's thank Dr. Ramchuk.